And everyone was like, man, I can't even imagine leaving here. Are we really moving out of South Commons? Because South Commons was more than just a neighborhood. It was a family. It was a family. It was very traumatic for us as kids. Yeah. I think some people just say it was a great housing development. Some people say it was an urban experiment, depending on who you talk to. I know that there were sociologists at University of Chicago who were sort of studying our every move. Our parents helped create a school there, Drake South Commons, a little bit of the Chicago Public Schools help. And then at one point, they couldn't really get the Chicago Public Schools help to keep the school going. It right. was real political. Right. I'm having a fascinating deep dive into the archives. Of some, it really Make happened. Switch. You mean in terms of moving becoming, into, oh, into being film. a writer? Yeah, becoming a writer yeah, and, well, and entering um, the business. Yeah, I mean, I, do, I just want to say for those who are yeah. looking for advice, yes. I made up business cards. Okay. It said Jill Soloway, PA. Wow. I looked in the creative directory of a hundred different people who worked in the production business. I wrote every single one a letter. Wow. A little business card attached. Wow. And then every day I would call them up and I would say, hey, Madeline, this is Jill Soloway. I just sent you my resume and business card. I'm in the neighborhood and I'm wondering if I can stop wow. by and connect a name with a face. Yeah. And they would say, sure. I wouldn't be in the neighborhood, but I would just go over exactly. and then go say, hi, I just want to say hi. And then I'm the person who thing and off I go. I was motivated. I, my very first job was uh, on the Steve Harvey show. Okay. I was a staff writer on the Steve Harvey show. Winifred Harvey gave me my first job. Not here. No, no, this is in okay, LA. Yeah, okay. yeah, this is in, this is. <laughs> way back. Yeah, way okay. back in, yeah, probably 90, 94, 95. Uh-huh. And then just kind of moved up through the okay. ranks of TV shows. You okay. start writing and mm -hmm. your name gets passed around and there's there's levels. You go staff writer, story editor, executive story editor, co-producer, producer, right. supervising producer. You know, you just go up the levels. It's exactly. like swim patches at camp. You know, create a little imaginary world where I can feel safe to explore these feelings. Yeah. And also to make the world safer, a safer place for my parents exactly. to, be, to be out. Exactly. And then um, as I got to know so many trans people working on the show, then I started to go through my own gender questioning and wondering, uh, you know, ab about whether or not a cis identity was really me. And so I've done my own shifting and identify as non-binary now, which mm -hmm. happened really slowly but surely. And um, it feels like a, a revolution. You know, in some ways, the civil rights revolution, the feminist mm -hmm. revolution that was happening mm -hmm. in South Commons that kind of made me be somebody who wanted to be part of a revolution. Right. I think primed me to take this opportunity with Amazon to not just make a TV show, but try to make a TV show that was going to feel like it could be a revolution too. I only came out as queer maybe like about five or six years ago. I'm a late okay. late bloomer. Okay. Um, we, Faith and I did used to go to the gay pride parade and just kind of, you know, here we were both not out, but one day would be queer people mm -hmm. just watching and kind of fascinated with the LGBTQ movement. But I really see, um, I'm, I really see kind of the connectivity between all people who are otherized. Okay. So I work, you know, as part of Time's Up with this group called 5050 by 2020. That's right. Where we're working on kind of the cultural, uh, cultural building artist power and cultural power and naming uh, the sort of other protagonists, right. meaning not just LGBTQ people, but always trying to say at the same time women and people of color, LGBTQ people, people with disabilities, all otherized people. Right. Because when you live in white supremacy and patriarchy, it's hard to really get out there and name the kind of access and privilege that white men have had. Right. And, that's, and so we all kind of get divided. We go LGBTQ, we go people of color, we say people with disabilities, and, yes. and, 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 by, and by naming and siloing off all of the different movements, right. it's, it's almost like we're afraid to talk about patriarchy and white supremacy, mm. because patriarchy and white supremacy find ways to other us and to keep us separate, to keep exactly. us kind of fighting for our own power. What's, what's, your, um, what's your advice, you know? What do you well, say? I think, you know, just making things with your friends, mm -hmm. finding your tone and your voice with people who make you feel safe and comfortable. So if you're a comedian or a writer, just make things. And then you have to be willing to show them, show them to people and share them with people. I'm sure you know this is a writer. Mm -hmm. And be open enough to allow people into your journey, mm -hmm. but not, not so open that they can stop you. Uh -huh. It's really kind of political being an artist because you have to ask people to come along with you, whether uh -huh. it's a gallery owner, or a film producer, or a book publisher. Right. And I find that a lot of people will go, here's my thing, now make it. Right. And then you try to give them notes, and they're just trying to, you know, it's like, no, you have to, if somebody's going to publish your book, you have to let them in. Right. If somebody's going to make your film, you have to bring them in. Right. But you can't 
it's, it's like there's a nuanced place in between where you bring people along, but you don't let them slow you down. 